Now we are through all the layers and our communication network. So what's left to talk about? Well, CDN, ICN, P2P. What does it mean? Here I will present you three additional topics that the first one reshape the internet as we know it from old textbooks or the second one offer a complete different communication paradigm or the third one that has uh, had its high times around 2000 2005 with legal and sometimes bit illegal activities but it's now integrated in many applications peer to peer networks so let's start with the first content delivery networks CDNs, what do we need them for? Well, first scenario, think of uploading a video to a web server. Yeah, like this video you're currently watching to YouTube, for example. That means the web server has a huge database, okay, with all the millions of videos. And the web server serves the requests to play the videos on demand, okay. Sounds simple, we know how this works, we know DNS, we know HTTP. The problem is how to scale this. What if we have billions of videos? So a single server obviously cannot deal with it. I explained in the context of HTTP and web already the different layers, how you can do load balancing, etc. But still, hmm, does this scale especially You have very different delays for the end users. Maybe some of the users are closer to the server, some are further away. Even with the server farm, this doesn't help. Second scenario, distribute software. So you have millions of end users and now you want to update. Well, definitely, maybe you don't want to do this in the same second, but maybe it's a security critical update. You have to perform the update within, let's say, one day or two days. Again, a single server cannot deal with the load and you may have different delays. So how can you handle this? Not with just one server farm, even if you have many, many, many of the servers. I will show you why. So what are some of the examples with very, very high data rates? Here you see two tables, one in Asia collected an, uh, an, at an ISP And you see the typical web pages, applications there and the traffic they generate. And the right hand side, North America, you see Netflix, YouTube, etc. So you see the traffic rates are already quite high. And this is not the update example, but here for uh, the video example. So what to do? Definitely not a single server, not a server farm in one location, but a so-called content delivery network. So what is the idea here? So it's similar to DNS caching. You basically cache the content. So maybe you have an origin server somewhere in the US and then you distribute content. For example, my update, you distribute it to a server in South America, to one in Europe, and to one in Asia or to 100 in Europe or whatever. So the CDNs, they have caches distributed all over the world and basically replicate the content closer to the customer. And that's exactly the idea. So you as a customer, you access the cache. Hopefully the cache close by instead of the central server. And this really lowers the delay a lot. Um, okay, nice idea, but there are several challenges. So, okay, we replicate content, all the content, only parts of the content. So everything that's maybe too much. And when do we replicate? And then if someone requests content, how do we route the request to the cache nearby? How do we know the location? So two challenges. So first of all, the replication. There are two basic strategies, one pull and one push. So what does pull strategy mean? Well, if there is a first request 
for a certain content, then you fetch the data and then from a web server to some kind of a central distribution system and you replicate it into all the cache where the request comes from. And when the cache is full, you erase simply the least recently used or whatever strategy you have. It's like all the caching strategies. So pull or push. So maybe you know that, oh, there's a new episode of some famous uh, whatever content movie and then you expect that someone wants to see this. They expect it to be popular and then you can pre-provision this content in the caches. And big CDNs like Google and Akamai, they use both strategies, push and pull. Okay, so we know the strategies. Now the question is, where do we place the servers? So, I mean, now you're a content provider, content provider like Disney, for example, or a pure CDN company like Akamai. The question is, where to place it? I mean, you have your customer, okay, and there you have your original server with the database and the content. Obviously, it would be best to bring the content very close to the customer. Okay, so the customer sits somewhere uh, at home, the customer is connected to its local service provider, uh, the service provider is then connected to whatever uh, many ASs, etc., as we know it. So you learned how the network looks like. So bring it to the customer at home, maybe that's a problem. So to the DSL route, for example, maybe uh, too much. So one of the ideas, okay, why not placing it into the network of a service provider? Why should they do it? Different question. But that's one of the ideas. Or we say, okay, why as a content provider, why shouldn't we simply operate our own worldwide network. That's also what some of the content providers do. So the idea is we want to deliver the content as fast as possible. And here we have two design principles. Well, one is, as I showed, okay, we place our servers into the points of presence, so where the service provider is. So this really comes very close to the end user. It's a bit more complex to maintain and to shuffle the content among the servers. So the servers are in different autonomous systems, etc. And you may need a lot of these servers. And then there's another strategy, example Limelight. Although in practice there's always a mixture also for these companies. That's just an example. So maybe we have a few huge CDN data centers and they are then connected to the ISP, so it's less from maintenance point of view. And then the data centers, well, they depend which data center you choose on the location of the ISP. So you're not directly inside the ISP, outside but close. So it's a bit higher delays and uh, you can imagine the peering links between the network where you are, the system, and the ISPs, they can be heavily loaded. Uh, but well, low maintenance. And as I said, you can do both. So these two design principles, they have uh, their names and this is called on-net or off-net deployment model. So on-net, that means the CDN has its own network, own autonomous system and the cache is in the autonomous system of the provider, the CDN provider. So that's on net. And off net, that means you're inside the autonomous system of an ASP, that's off net. And that means you're closer to the customer, but then you have this, uh, well, you have a server in the AS of someone else, and this might be a bit more complex. But the delay, that's the idea, the delay is lower here compared to the other solution. 
Okay, so, but how do we find the closest location of our cache? Well, you can use DNS. So you can use DNS to refer the request of the client. So you want to access, for example, this youtube.com. And then it's the job of DNS to tell you an IP address. We learned this. So now you can tweak the DNS in a way that depending on your location, the DNS will tell you different addresses. So maybe in the EU you will get this, but if you're located in the US, you will get a complete uh, different whatever address. So that's the idea. So the name server perform the address resolution for certain content based on the geographical position of the source address. And there are special databases that tell you here two examples. Well, if you have this IP address, then I assume this is the closest cache. So the idea is if I have a cache in the US and you have here in Europe also a cache, if you're a customer in Europe, it will redirect you to this cache. Sometimes there are limitations and sometimes you don't want this cache. Then you can always, from your place, create a VPN, this example, to the US. And then it looks like, oh, you're in the US. And then it will re redirect you to the US. So if you don't, don't like the European cache, for example. So how is this done? Simple example. So you are here, this client, and you have your DNS request. We know how this works for a web page. And then this the local DNS will ask this authoritative DNS, for example, for YouTube. And this will now check location. So what is the location? And then return with an answer that tells you, well, yes, sure, access the content server here in Berlin, and not the one in New York. So again, think of the location lookup depends on which IP address. Think of things like NAT, or if you have VPNs, etc. So depending on certain other settings, this might not be the closest cache. Sometimes you don't like the closest cache, sometimes you like, so there are some pitfalls here. So what has to be well thought of this, that typically today's web content address that often involves a DNS resolution through DNS over HTTP, and this then followed by the resource delivery via the CDNs, and we learned what DOH means. Okay, so how can this be done? Well, this redirection. So the idea is, you know, that if you go for this URL, then we know, okay, there can be several, you know, canonical names and depending on the setting, you see several of these redirection. So this makes it quite flexible. So you map this bestbuy.com to a certain edge key.net uh, address, and then this one to some whatever Akamai in this example, and then this Akamai to a certain IP address. And this mapping now, this can depend on the location. We learned that these entries have a certain lifetime, so you can redirect depending on demands, depending on setting up new uh, caches, etc. Or preparing now the big download of the newest movie and so on. So this referencing delegation, so this can be done in a quite flexible way.
So you can have multiple levels of DNS servers and these redirection. And I, I would say a bit more extreme example is exactly this updating, for example, of an operating system. And this is an overview without going into all the details what happened at an up update uh, at Apple. So in 2017, when the entry point, the entry point is quite stable, was a certain URL, apple apple.com. And uh, then the world was separated here at the next level, you see, into China, India, and the rest of the world. So the rest of the world going here. And then you see how, well, in the end, you could do load balancing across several levels. There's a CDN of Akamai involved, Limelight, Apple themselves. And you see how you can have several levels of load balancing, sharing, if something goes wrong, that you have additional caches, etc. So that, that's quite ex extreme, but this is just an example to show you what can be done with this idea of basically redirecting. You have a request for a certain resource, and then you will get answers depending on location, depending on some other decisions by the companies, and you end up with some of the CDN networks, Akamai or the provider in this example, Apple itself. It can be even more complicated uh, using HTTP redirect. That's also a possibility so that you as a user, you want to get some uh, content and depending on, you see here the request for Audi, maybe you get a redirect. You may directly access this. You access this and you get redirects. And then you get the answer maybe from here in AS, from German Telecom. And then there is a infrastructure from Akamai, etc., etc. So many levels of redirections. And the question is, um, hmm. so where does some content come from? So does in the end, for example, the domain where the web page belongs to, so www.audi.com, uh, is this the same where the content here comes from as Audi, the company itself, where this domain is? And also, if you uh, do some statistics about where do different countries get their content from. So, for example, if you check if you have a request from Africa, then although the companies may be in, in uh, Africa, but the content, as you see, oh, here comes, for example, is served from North America. That's also true from Europe. You see that part comes from Europe, same for Africa. And you see only a small part really comes from Africa, even if you are in Africa. So each line shows you the percentage of all requests that originate from a continent like Africa here. And you see where the content then really comes from. So a lot comes from North America. Okay, so that's not optimal. So because if you're located in Africa, your content should come from Africa. Well, that's the idea of the CDN if it's fully deployed. But as you see here, uh, it's still a delay will be higher if you live in Africa. Changing over time, that's just a sh snapshot. So how important are these CDNs overall if we look at the traffic? Well, we can say the CDNs really dominate the majority of all consumer traffic. So you see here, 2018, it was already 90% of all the consumer traffic was served by CDNs. Only a small percentage really comes from a server 
if you think of a company running a web server and then really the content comes from this web server, the huge majority comes from CDNs. So you can be sure all the newspapers and whatever you typically access, all the content comes from CDNs and not from a server operated by this company. So that's quite interesting and this really reshapes the way we should, I mean, look at the internet, how the internet really works. And this also, just a side note, influences routing. We are here at the CDNs, but we covered routing. And I told you that backbound routers, they have to maintain many, many paths and they have to select then the optimum path, etc., to forward a packet. But we can also see that the vast majority of traffic flows along less than 500 paths. Why? Well, in the end, because those paths, they lead to CDNs. So no matter, almost, we see a large percentage, which web server you want to access, you will end up in one of the, I would say, big 10 CDN operators. So maybe there are thousands of web domains. You end up always with the same dozen CDN operators. So and this graph also shows uh, you this. So that's the cumulative distribution function of a traffic. And um, you see that a small percentage, let's say, for example, 100 routes, in the router already handle more than 80% of the traffic. So how does this influence routing? Well, that makes the job for the router simpler. You don't have to check or, uh, in all these 800,000 paths. So if you have an ultra fast cache for these top whatever 100 or top 500 or something like this, so if you go for 500, then you're already uh, beyond the 90%, then that's fine for more than 90% of the packets. Now that simplifies routing. Okay, so now we have content delivery networks. So that, remember, they try to bring content closer to the customer. Okay, what else do we have in the internet? The CDNs. Okay. We have content providers. Content providers are companies like uh, Disney, like whatever, uh, Netflix, like, uh, but also Amazon uh, and many more, Paramount and so on and so on. So movies, but also other type of content. We have cloud providers like Microsoft, etc. We have CDN operators and what happens if you're all three, or more or less all the three in one company. Companies like Google, Netflix, but also Meta, Meta, Facebook, um, they are responsible for the huge majority of traffic. And these companies are thus called hypergiants. And if we look at the distribution of the traffic, then it can be shown that in 2007, here, we needed, well, more than 1,000 different autonomous systems to reach 50% of the worldwide traffic. 2007, it was 2,000. 2009, 150. 2016, 10. 2019, only five hypergiants, five sites in the end, five huge companies contribute to 50% of the traffic. So there's an extreme consolidation of the worldwide traffic to very, very few companies. And this has some consequences if we think of what about reliability, stability of the whole network, etc.? 
this now pretty much also depends on the policies of the companies, etc. Not talking about misconfiguration and etc. So those hypergiants, they, they optimize content delivery. Yes, they reduce latency and they absolutely enhance user experience. That's, that's the whole idea. But the impact on today's internet traffic is immense. And this also challenges all the traditional peering models because if a content provider also has the network, then the, this content provider has the network, deploys its own CDN, and then defines where the caches are and defines where uh, I, if the, then this hypergiant peers with ISPs that finally has customers. And sometimes also those hypergiants directly try to get the customers. And you see this also um, where those hypergiants place their servers. Offnet, remember, that was I have my CDN server, my CDN server in the IS of an ISP. So it's an autonomous system. I have my CDN server. And you see over time, starting 2013 here up to 2021, you see, for example, that Google placed its server in more and more autonomous systems. That means in also more and more ISPs. Similar is true for Meta, Facebook, uh, and Netflix. So you see, this is the strategy for the companies with content like Google, like Facebook, like Netflix, they want to be present in the different autonomous systems so that the customers have a better user experience. Now, this can be also seen if we look, for example, here at the Facebook offnet servers located in ASs of different ASPs. That was the situation in 2017. So we already saw a larger concentration uh, here, especially Mexico. It covered 100% of all the uh, ASs responsible for Mexico. And there were some here in Europe, uh, some in India and very few in Africa and some here in South America. And within only four years, this picture changed dramatically. You see so many more new Facebook servers all over the planet. And for some of the countries you see here, it covers 100% of the autonomous system. So the servers of Facebook are in all ISP networks. And that means typically closer to the customer, assuming that the ISP tries to have a fast connection to its customer. So to summarize, Advantages and disadvantages of CDNs. Definitely way more robust. Try to attack so many caches. That's almost impossible. You've seen how many servers Facebook has. There's so many caches. How should you attack them all at the same time? So that's not trivial. Scalability, definitely given. I mean, the, the load is spread to thousands of servers. Absolutely. We also see latency slower because we are close to the customer. So closer to customer compared to data has to travel across the Atlantic. Sure, there's also a downside. It makes the internet, the services are more complex also for diagnosis, where does traffic flow? Uh, so how does it look like if you want to follow traffic, you want, if you want to understand certain things in the internet? And if you especially, if we go into edge and fog computing for further study, then this blurs the picture uh, even more. So edge computing, this could even mean that you download the data to a box really close to your home, the curb, for example. So overall, we can say those hypergiants, they really reshape the internet, they improve capacity, 
way better when it comes to latency and also congestion is not the big issue anymore. But the downside is, well, <laughs> so how do you then overall do the traffic engineer or do those hyper giants in the end control how this is done? So some questions to this first topic of the chapter. So why having CDNs? What was the main motivation for doing so? And what are additional benefits? So we had a reason for doing so, but there are some additional benefits having CDNs. If you look at the internet of today and the internet of, let's say, 20 years ago, how did the CDNs really reshape the internet? If you access a web page, for example, how does the CDN find the real the closest cache? The appropriate one. We had several strategies for content replication. Pull versus push. What are the pros? What are the cons? And what is this off-net deployment? And why do the CDN companies try to have this off-net deployment? What is the advantage? And then we had the hypergiant. So what is a hypergiant? And what is the influence of the hypergiant? And how do the hypergiants in the end dominate the internet? What are the consequences?